Uh, welcome, my name is Henry Neiman. This is the uh, eighth SC workshop on best practices for HPC training and education. Uh, and this talk is on a uh, pilot study under the cyber training program at the National Science Foundation called the Professional Development and Certification Program for Cyber Infrastructure Facilitators. Uh, and my co-authors and co-PIs on that project are Dana Brunson of Internet2 and Dirk Colbury of Michigan State. Uh, we have lots of other folks on that project. All right, so here's a quick look at the grants for this project, uh, the grant for the project, and uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of it, uh, but uh, real quick outline. So we have the virtual residency program. I'll give you a quick introduction to that. Uh, then we'll talk about this new project, the Certified Cyber Infrastructure Facilitator Training and Development or SIFTED project. We'll talk about badges and evaluation. And I'm gonna run out of time before I run out of slides. So I'll just chug along until the time runs out. Uh, in real life, you'll be welcome to interrupt whenever you want. Uh, so the virtual residency program, what is it? Uh, this is a program where we teach cyber infrastructure facilitators how to do cyber infrastructure facilitation uh, or how to do it better if they're already doing it. Uh, how do we do that? Well, there's several components. One is every summer we do a week-long workshop that's been going on since 2015. We're about to start planning the 2022 workshop. Uh, and uh, this year it was at the beginning of June, the first full week of June. Uh, we don't yet have a date for next year, but we have a poll going to find out what's the, what's the best week for that. Uh, we do workshop planning calls, uh, eh, typically about every other week, uh, usually starting in mid-fall. Um, we have had as uh, a total of 430 different people participate in those calls. Uh, we have a, a couple of apprenticeships. One is a grant proposal writing apprenticeship. That's actually how we got this grant. Uh, that's been running since 2017. We've had almost 200 people participate in that. And we've had a paper writing apprenticeship and we've written three and published three papers at the PERC conference uh, and over a hundred participants in that. Who are we talking about? Well, we've had over 1100 people from over 400 institutions in every US state and every EPSCOR jurisdiction, plus 13 other countries around the world. I think we've only done five continents. I don't think we've done South America yet, and I don't hold out much hope for Antarctica, but otherwise we've covered the gamut pretty well. That includes 64 minority serving institutions. That's uh, about one seventh of the virtual residency institutions and about one sixth of all bachelor's granting minority serving institutions and about one tenth of all minority serving institutions, bearing in mind that a lot of minority serving institutions are either community colleges or career techs. We've had over a hundred non PhD granting institutions, about a quarter of the total, over a hundred institutions in every EPSCOR jurisdiction, as I mentioned, uh, again, about a quarter of the total uh, and 272 institutions, about two thirds of the virtual residency institutions are also campus champion institutions, and that covers about 80% of the campus champion institutions. Uh, the demographics for our 2020 workshop, we did an evaluation in 2020. Uh, the demographics, uh, almost 30% of our participants were women. That's about double what we see at the SC conferences as SC has reported on their website. Uh, and it's a little higher than all computing and IT occupations as a whole, although, of course, it's substantially below the U.S. population. Uh, for underrepresented minorities, about 18% of our participants. Uh, we don't know what it is for SC because that's never been reported publicly that we're aware of, but it's almost double the rate for all computing and IT occupations. Uh, and, and, of course, substantially below the U.S. population as a whole. Uh, then with the apprenticeships, I think the key takeaway is the grant proposal apprenticeship. We submitted three failed proposals, two of which were earlier versions of this same proposal that um, is the new grant, but now we finally got that awarded. And so the grant proposal writing apprenticeship, uh, which has served over 150 institutions in 44 states, three territories, and three other countries, um, is now on hiatus because we got the grant. Uh, the paper writing apprenticeship is not on hiatus, and in fact, we just started that up again this week as I make this recording. Uh, does the virtual residency work? Well, 
Uh, we had uh, external evaluators, Lizanne DeStefano and Lorna Rivera. Lorna is now gone to industry. Uh, they did an evaluation of our workshop a year and a half ago. Uh, and the lowest rated session was a 3.9 on a one to five scale. So maybe a B minus at worst. Almost all the sessions were rated above a four. Um, and the, the highest rated was about a 4.4. Uh, what they found, what Lizanne and Lorna found was that um, in terms of statistically significant differences for underrepresented minorities, everywhere where there was a statistically significant difference for underrepresented minorities between them and everybody else, what we found was they actually liked it better um, in every single case. Uh, for women, there was only one question where women were statistically significantly different from men. And there it was, they found one session 10% less helpful. They rated it 10% lower than the men did. That was it. Other than that, no statistically significant differences for either women or underrepresented minorities. Now, the other answer to the question, does the virtual residency work, is do people keep coming back, or at least institutions? Uh, so it turns out that about three quarters of institutions have come back for multiple events, and in fact, um, in most cases, multiple different kinds of events. And these are busy folks. If it wasn't valuable, why would they keep coming back? All right, and then here's kind of a bibliography of papers that we published about this. The first three, the ones in purple, uh, those were actually done as part of the paper writing apprenticeship. Now let's move on and talk about the Certified Cyber Infrastructure Facilitator Training and Development, or CIFTID, program. And we'll do a quick overview of that. So first, let's talk about what we mean by certification. So we're not talking about a matriculated graduate or undergraduate certificate attached to a degree, for example. Uh, and we're not talking about a participation certi certificate. Certification, we got this from a GIS certifying organization, uh, a process often voluntary by which individuals who have demonstrated a level of expertise in the profession are identified to the public and other stakeholders by a third party. So maybe an example here would be like CISSP for secure, uh, cybersecurity professionals or RHCE for system administrators, that sort of thing. Um, so what's sifted? Uh, I already said the thing out for you. Uh, we're actually, we haven't even created our webpage yet and we're already the third link on Google. Uh, we are not the Canadian Center for International Fisheries Training and Development. I'm sure they do a lovely job, but that's somebody else. Um, it's the first of its kind. It's non-matriculated. It's informal education. Um, and it's not just a participation thing. You actually have to pass exams. Okay. So how is this done? It's a badging system. We, you have many different badge opportunities where a badge consists of a training module, an exam, and a scoring rubric for that exam. And then um, certification comes from specific collections of badges. Why aren't we doing a degree program or a grad certificate, something matriculated? Well, we don't expect the numbers to be high enough to justify creating a degree or certificate program because you do that at a specific institution. And the problem then is that institution is not going to attract enough people to that institution to justify creating a degree program or a certificate program at that institution. There's a few thousand people spread out over the entire US. Um, the other problem is that most people have never heard of cyber infrastructure facilitation. So you could create a degree program and in similar kinds of contexts, other institutions have done that, but it hasn't worked out well. So if they're not gonna know what the name of the thing means, they're not going to pursue it if they don't pursue it, you end up with low uptake. Um, there are more and more facilitators and more and more institutions. So this is actually a bit out of date because this only goes back to 2019. But from 2008 to 2019, we grew from 10 people in the combination of the virtual residency, the campus champions, and the CARC researcher facing track to 1,250. And likewise, from 10 institutions to over 400. All right, so for SIFTED, what are the objectives? We break it down into three categories of perspective. The CI facilitators, what are their objectives? Well, get proof that you have had training and mastery in the skills that are mission critical to cyber infrastructure facilitation. Um, and then 
let's have more facilitators, so grow the community. From the perspective of providers of cyber infrastructure, so cyber infrastructure organizations like HPC centers, increase uptake of facilitation, which will increase uptake of cyber infrastructure. From the perspective of the researchers, get help doing STEM research using cyber infrastructure, therefore increase research productivity. What's the method? Well, we sort of have five pieces. First, let's figure out what the skills are. And we, we believe we know some of them. Let's figure out what the skills are that are the most valuable for cyber infrastructure facilitation by surveying three groups. First, the facilitators, particularly experienced facilitators. What do you wish you had known about? What had, do you wish you'd had training on when you got started that would have eased you along and there would have been less stumbles along the way? We'll find a better way to word that question. The second group is directors of cyber infrastructure organizations. So what skills do you believe your cyber infrastructure facilitators need to have in order to be effective and valuable and valued by your researchers? And then we'll also ask the organization directors, who are some STEM researchers who have a lot of experience consuming facilitation that we can ask for further information about what they think would be valuable skills. And then we'll go to those STEM researchers. We can't ask all STEM researchers, that's a huge group of people, but go to those STEM researchers and say, you know, what skills do you wish cyber infrastructure facilitators have? What skills have you found to be the most valuable? The second thing is for each of those skills, develop a training mechanism. Uh, and that could be anything from, you know, text documents, videos, live sessions, whatever it might be, an exam instrument and a scoring rubric for that exam. And then pilot test that um, both at the virtual residency workshops and through online capabilities. A lot of these things can be done asynchronously. Uh, construct certification pathways, sets of badges that indicate and that merit certification, being a sifted uh, cyber infrastructure facilitator, certified cyber infrastructure facilitator. Test those badging methods using the workshops and the online material, and then evaluate the program both formatively as the program is progressing to improve it as it goes, and summatively at the end to determine how successful was it. So what are the challenges that we have for certification? Well, one of the things is we need to know what skills the facilitators need, and we talked about that. We need to find out how to build credibility so that the facilitators are trusted by the researchers and by their institutions to add value to their research and to improve their research productivity. How then do we train enough facilitators to meet the need? How do we know that what we're doing works? And how can we sustain it beyond the near term? You know, this grant is a two-year grant. It's a pilot study grant. Um, a couple of questions that we're not gonna cover in the pilot project how do we expand to multiple levels of certification? So this pilot project is just the first level of certification, but we can see that there would be value having multiple levels. Um, and how do we then ultimately address the needs of industry, which are gonna be orders of magnitude larger? Now we have a committee, or we're in the process of forming a committee, um, whose job is to regulate and govern all of that. So they will be elected by members of the relevant stakeholder communities, and what are they going to do? They're going to develop the policies, both during and after grant funding, implement the policies, particularly about badging certification, solicit new badges uh, modif and modifications and updates to badges, review them, uh, recruit examiners for the badge exams, uh, graders, award badges when someone does the exam, passes the exam, um, create the certification pathways. So what collections of badges merit certification? Then award those certifications and also compensate people. You know, we could ask people to do this on a purely volunteer basis to create the training modules, to create the exams, to create the scoring rubrics, to do the scoring of the exams. We could ask people to do that as volunteers. I don't think we'd get that much uptake, but if we can provide them a little bit of compensation for that, then they're going to be much more willing to participate. Eh, people like money, who can blame them? 
Um, the committee in year one will be a sort of provisional government, uh, sort of self-appointed, and I'm the PI of the grant, so I'll be the chair of that committee in the first year, uh, and we'll develop the charter and bylaws and so on. In the second year, we'll add a second cohort, and they will be elected. In the third year, we from the first year will come to the end of our two-year term, so we'll retire. Now, some may choose to run for re-election, and that's perfectly great, um, but the the third cohort, which will show up at the beginning of year three, the third cohort will be all elected. And so at that point, the entire committee will be elected. So who's eligible to elect and to be elected? Virtual residents, campus champions, park researcher facing folks, and there's inevitably going to be other groups as well. Okay. Now, just as we had a grant proposal writing apprenticeship, we also now have a grant proposal, a grant running apprenticeship, teach people how to run a grant of their own by running the grant together as a group. And so we're getting together week by week on Zoom uh, and having these calls working together to uh, figure out how to do all the tasks of the grant. Okay, And I think that's actually already out of date. We might be at five meetings by now, um, but we've had 40 distinct people participate in these meetings uh, from 35 uh, institutions in 21 states. You can see all the statistics there, but that's just going to grow over time. Um, so uh, we now have opportunities for people to learn how to write a grant proposal, how to write a scholarly publication, and now how to run a grant project. Uh, so the, the cyber training program requires what's called a network of funded and unfunded collaborators. So we have a great many senior personnel, most of whom serve in that role. Some of them serve in other roles as well. Um, so they are effectively co-authors of this talk. All right, let's talk about badges. And again, I'm not going to have time to get through all of the content that I've got, um, but um, try to make the most of the time we have. So there are five um, categories that we've already identified. More may be coming. One is the professional and or interpersonal skills. Uh, one is understanding what it's like to be a researcher because that helps build credibility with the researchers and also makes you more effective because you understand what the context of their work is. There's technical content, uh, research data, life cycle um, and the cyber infrastructure landscape. Um, so under professional and interpersonal skills, the number one is effective communication. We've been teaching that way since the first workshop way back in 2015. Um, recruiting researchers, again, we've been teaching that for a long time. Uh, uh, recruiting them both to use facilitation and to use the cyber infrastructure. And then intake interviews, how to have your first meeting with a new researcher and figure out very quickly what is it that they're trying to do and what is it that you can do to help them be more effective or to be able to do it at all. Maybe they've hit some speed bump. Um, understanding researcher circumstances, a colleague of mine here at my institution uh, created a talk about essentially what it's like to be faculty and what the reward structure is and so on and tenure and promotion, all that good stuff. Um, and that's been incredibly effective helping people to learn uh, how to understand faculty and researchers more broadly, even if they themselves do not come from that background. Uh, and then how to fund the research, that's the grant proposal writing apprenticeship, and how to publish research, that's the paper writing apprenticeship. And all of the, and these have been going on for quite some time. Then technical content, how to use particular kinds of cyber infrastructure resources, um, how to use various research data management technologies, research networking, benchmarking, debugging, and testing, deploying community codes. And again, there'll be plenty more. This is just a jumping off point. And then research data lifecycle management, um, both data management best practices and regulated data of some kind, right? Um, although not all of it is legally regulated. Some of it is contractually constrained and so on. And then the cyber infrastructure landscape. So cyber infrastructure organizations, everything from Exceed, which is going to transition to Access, uh, Open Science Grid, the HPC modernization program, and so on and so on and so on, right? There are many of these. Uh, and then various cyber infrastructure resources at various levels. 
topics. Um, and then how are we gonna find the topics? Um, of course, we're gonna go ask people uh, for ideas, but in it, and I mentioned that before with the surveys, but in addition to that, we're gonna look at what's already out there and we're gonna leverage that. So for example, uh, the Carpentry Instructor Certification has a lot of useful information that would be valuable for um, facilitators to apply to their one-on-one, -on -one, even though it's not teaching in a group session uh, setting, that's still very valuable information for how to help people understand things, technical things. Uh, the Cyber Ambassadors Program, and I mentioned our, one of our co-PIs is uh, uh, Dirk Colbury, who is the PI of the Cyber Ambassadors Program. So we'll be adopting a substantial amount of that. I mean, arguably all of that into Sifted. Uh, Exceed has a badging system for technical skills. Uh, and there's a group called hpccertification.org that has been building certification for HPC. So whatever is available that is appropriate, we're likely to at least seriously consider adopting, probably in most cases adopting it. There's also the Research Computing and Data Professionals Job Elements and Career Guide, which grew out of some CARC efforts and such. Um, and that's got a section that's relevant. And so we'll, we'll be looking at that. Uh, and then I mentioned the, the um, survey. Training is not necessarily all synchronous. A lot of it, it, there's some sessions that have to be done live in person or live over video, uh, like the intake interview practicum, which we jokingly call speed dating, uh, where you actually talk to real researchers and ask them about their actual research. It's been, it's been very effective. We've gotten very uh, happy uh, responses, especially from the researchers themselves who get very useful um, technical information. Um, but a lot of the stuff can be done asynchronously with videos and written content and training websites and so on. Okay, so the certification pathways, let's learn a little bit about that. Um, we target for a certification about 15 badges and an individual badge we're targeting one to one and a half hours of training content before they're ready to take the exam. Um, so call it 15 to 23 hours of training is a badge. Um, so certification, there are there would be more badges than you need just to do the certification. So certification is based on having the right subset of badges. And the way that's structured is there are badges that are required to get the certification, and there are badges that can serve as electives. Uh, so much in the same way that you would build a degree uh, at a university, for example. Um, and the details of that is all going to be worked out by the SIFTED committee. Uh, so what are the required badges? Well, this was our first guess. This is not a final answer, but this was our first guess. So interpersonal skills, effective communication, recruiting researchers, intake interviews, uh, understanding research, researcher circumstances, the academic research roles and incentive structure, the, you know, how, what faculty are like session, uh, technical information, how to submit a batch job to a large scale resource. Doesn't have to be an HPC resource could be high throughput computing like Open Science Grid, but something along those lines. Then cyber infrastructure landscape, um, understanding of what cyber infrastructure resources are out there. Uh, and then research data lifecycle management, just some data management best practices. Those are the required ones. So you can see there's seven required badges. Almost half of the badges out of the 15 for certification would be required. And then another eight badges that are electives at least one in each of the five topic areas and at most three in any topic area. Um, so here's an example, three technical, two researcher circumstances, one interpersonal, one landscape and one research data, right? That would give you um, a good mix of skills and you'd be ready to, to get certification. That's it. Uh, and I believe there's a little time to take questions. Thanks so much.